Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Larry Norton. I'm the director of the Brennan Center's Election Reform Program. Welcome to the final event of our election security education series, brought to you in partnership with Microsoft's Defending Democracy team and in coordination with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency team at DHS. We've covered a lot of ground this year with panels on topics such as ransomware and election administration in a pandemic, a tabletop exercise, and a threat briefing featuring federal officials and cyber threat experts from technology firms. As we enter the final stretch before election day, we are joined by two of the best, and I think I'm allowed to say this, two of my favorite election officials. Uh, first, we have uh, New Mexico Secretary of State and president of a National Association of Secretaries of State, Maggie Toulouse Oliver, uh, and also uh, Green County, Missouri clerk and Senate Majority Leader appointee to the US Election Assistance Board of Advisors, Shane Scholler. Uh, in these final weeks, we know how valuable time is for anyone working in elections. So thank you, Maggie and Shane, for joining us and thank all of the other participants who are here today for, for taking time out for this hour of discussion. We're going to be taking audience questions, so feel free to submit your questions by using the Q&A feature anytime during our conversation. Um, but before we get to those questions, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative uh, and ask uh, a few of my own. So I'm, I'm going to start with uh, the most obvious one. Um, this is not the election that we were expecting uh, at the beginning of 2020. Um, Maggie, maybe I'll start with you. What are some of the biggest uh, challenges you and your uh, colleagues have faced this cycle? <laughs> well, thanks, Larry. Uh, and first of all, good morning to you and, and Shane and to everybody out there participating uh, in this, this uh, presentation today. Thanks to the Brennan Center for putting this on. Uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, this is not the election that we were expecting. And, and I don't know, uh, as the calendar ticked over from 2019 to 2020, that any of us knew, quite frankly, what this election would hold. I think we all knew this was going to be uh, an unprecedented election season uh, for a variety of reasons, right? Uh, and in short order, uh, the pandemic uh, became, you know, the focus of all of our lives. Uh, and of course, uh, it has impacted the administration of elections across this country in new and unprecedented ways. And as election officials, we're always, and I mean literally always preparing for anything that could possibly happen during an election and, uh, you know, making and, and fine tuning our, our emergency response plans and uh, ensuring that folks are trained and ready, that we have communications protocols in order. Uh, but this pandemic was an added layer of challenge and is an added layer of challenge for all of us. I think some of the bigger challenges that we've seen across the country in managing elections during this pandemic have been first and foremost, the increased uh, interest in and participation in voting by mail, especially in states and places where it wasn't great participation in, in that type of voting before. And so states uh, figuring out how to scale up very quickly their vote by mail operations educate their voters about how, where, and when to cast their ballots. Uh, we've seen jurisdictions across the country consolidating polling locations uh, in large because of the challenge of recruiting and uh, training poll officials in light of the pandemic. As most folks know, the vast majority of our poll officials, those volunteers that work at our polling places uh, throughout the country are, are our seniors, right? Uh, and so that being the particular group most at risk for contracting the virus in terms of sustaining complications, uh, we saw a sort of widespread dropping out of poll officials, uh, especially at the last minute in some cases as those early primaries were happening towards the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so a lot of changes very rapidly to accommodate the situation on the ground. And then of course, 
Last but not least, uh, making sure that our polling places are safe, right? Uh, that we have CDC guidelines that we can implement at polling places and COVID safe practices and the incredible amount of protective uh, private equipment and cleaning supplies that are necessary to keep those polling locations safe and socially distanced and sanitized so that not only voters, but voters are also protected at the polling place. These are all challenges uh, that have come as a result of, of the craziness of 2020. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> Shane, uh, uh, what about you? S similar, anything additional to, to what Maggie's mentioned? You know, as I've told people this, it's scaling up to each election. Really, we had the March presidential primary on the 10th of March. And literally by Thursday was when we began to see the state home orders begin to go into effect in terms of limiting how many people could be in a certain space. And even for that election, we began to um, communicate with the media to let our voters know, here's the precautions we're already going to take. At that time, you didn't have masking orders. You didn't have some of those things at that time. But we knew voters were concerned about their health coming in to vote for that presidential primary. And so we, for example, order nitrile gloves. We encourage voters, if you want to bring your own pen and stylus, you're welcome to do that. Um, and just really, that was, I think, a good opportunity to see what we were going to face as the year went along. And then um, in Missouri, we have literally three weeks between the presidential primary and our local elections that are statewide. Um, and so we then had to literally, by the end of that week, begin and early the next week, begin to make preparations to change the date of that election. And here in our state, that cannot be unilaterally done. It requires each county to go into the appellate court, the jurisdiction. Um, and so there's um, three different jurisdictions in our state. <clears throat> we had individuals go and petition them um, here in the Southern Appellate where I'm at. Um, you know, we worked with our attorney. We had other counties sign on to our petition. Um, Western jurisdiction said, no, you have to petition as a county by yourself. They would not allow that to happen um, in the Western jurisdiction. And so, you know, even in that, there was a challenge. Now, fortunately, we got the date moved to June 2nd, which happened to be my 19-year wedding anniversary, so that didn't go too well at home. But, hey, it's 2020, right? And so, um, but at the end of the day, you know, we got that done. Our governor did issue an, exec an emergency um, order changing the date of the election, but we still felt like we had to go to the court in case someone was a sore loser and said, well, the governor didn't have that authority per statute to do that. So that was one of the first challenges. Um, and then, frankly, um, as we've, you know, went into each election, you know, we've scaled up each time, we've taken notes. But I think that one that we're seeing now, and I think this is across the nation, is correct and accurate information. Um, you know, one, the laws have changed in our state in terms of how you can vote by mail, and those are good things, but they've also created uncertainty with the voter in terms of how they can correctly apply. And then just the internet rumors out there um, that are flourishing, um, trying to make sure that um, we're putting out those bad, that bad information to make sure people have good information. And then finally, scaling up to meet the absentee mail and request. Um, for example, in 2016, we had a total of 3,000 absentee ballots mailed. Um, our first set that we mailed when absentee voting began back on September 22nd, we had 12,000 at the beginning. And so that's a significant change for not my on myself, but I know election officials across the nation. And how do you go from a vote in person model to more of a vote by mail model? And especially, I mean, I feel for those election officials who had to completely change from voting in person to suddenly all vote by mail and the challenges that they've had to face. Probably none of them are on the call today because of the challenges that has presented. Um, but nonetheless, um, those are the things that we have faced during this election. I know I'm not alone that people who are a part of this are probably nodding their heads like Maggie is because we've all faced it together. So. It really is remarkable. Somebody somebody needs to write this story after this election is over uh, about just the incredible adjustments that were made to, to pull this off. Uh, it's amazing. Um, so I want to turn to, I, I work at an outside organization that hopes that it provides useful information to election officials, useful resources um, and assistance. Uh, there are obviously a lot, a lot of um, groups and government agencies in this space now from from uh, CISA uh, and the Election Assistance Commission to um, 
to non-governmental organizations um, like the Brennan Center and others. Um, I'm, I'm curious, and, and maybe we'll start with you, Shane. Um, if you if you can identify some one or two resources that have you you found have been particularly helpful this cycle. Well, and of course, Brennan, you're always helpful in terms of being able to get the information out there. And you didn't ask me to say that, so that was on my <laughs> own. Um, so I, we appreciate what now. you do um, across the board. And of course, you know, recently, you know, the Center for Tech and Civic Life, you know, they were able to put those grant fund funds out there. But as anyone who's been in elections know that they are there year in, year out to help you in terms of election administration. Um, and then our Secretary of State here in our state, Jay Ashcroft, has been um, working on the cybersecurity front and has helped provide grant funds and services there to help make sure that we're prepared in terms of, you know, as we all know, the issue in 2016 was the computer virus. And I often joke, I didn't think they could get trumped until the coronavirus came along. And now that virus has trumped the computer virus. But nonetheless, really, we're working on two fields at the same time. And it's very important that we not neglect um, the computer um, in terms of the hacking and the concerns people have cybersecurity wise. And so um, now I would admit, I think a lot of election was meant, we haven't been able to keep as close of an eye on that as we want to because of the challenges we've had with the coronavirus in terms of COVID-19. But nonetheless, we continue to work with our IS department. We continue to work with Secretary of State. We continue to do everything we can to make sure that we are prepared for that um, as well. And then, um, you know, the CARES grant funding as well. You know, having those funds in place that came specific for elections. And then our county was granted, you know, a certain round of funding as well. And we actually applied for that funding. And so with the CTCL funds and then the CARE grant funds, and then just organizations like Brennan, CTCL, others, it has made a big difference in terms of making sure that we have those resources available. That's great to hear. We, we, had, we had hoped that we, we could get a little bit more federal funding, but I think uh, that's probably not gonna happen in the remaining couple of weeks. Um, Maggie, what about you? Well, first, I'd, I'd echo everything Shane just said, uh, and particularly those trickling down to the, the county and local jurisdiction, um, you know, which are often the last to get the resources that they need to effectively conduct elections. Um, I'll, I'll add in from a, a state a chief election official perspective um, that Homeland Security um, has grown to be a, a partner for us uh, over the last four years. And, and we have diligently, through our National Association of Secretaries of State, worked very closely with them to build and strengthen that partnership uh, nationwide. Um, you know, as, as Shane mentioned, local election officials so are having to be so focused on exactly what's going on there at the ground level in managing elections. Um, but state election officials not working hard, uh, as Shane mentioned, to help provide them the resources but we're also, we can't afford to take our eye off the ball of cybersecurity. In fact, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has provided sort of ample opportunity for especially foreign actors and threats to uh, continue um, the, the misinformation and disinformation and, and to continue their vectors of attack on or, or attempt to attack on our state election systems. Um, so so DHS and FBI in particular have been tremendous partners. Uh, at the state level, we have also had access to grant funding, uh, not through CCL, but through the Center for uh, Election and Research, um, which has been tremendous. Uh, we've received that grant funding here in New Mexico, as well as 10 of our local jurisdictions receiving those CTCL funds. Um, in light of, of, you know, again, the need for PPE, especially um, having those funds and the CARES Act funds uh, that Shane has been absolutely critical in helping us fill that gap, meet that need that was created uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, and also, it's helped us be able to better our voters. You know, as Shane mentioned, a lot of changes have happened um, to election, election processes around the country in sort of the 11th hour of the election. Sort of generally speaking, as election administrators, we hate doing, we don't want to change. Um, but the, the conditions on the ground, the reality of the pandemic um, has, has sort of forced us to do that. Having those CARES Act funds and those grant funds have helped us not only meet whatever need uh, falling short on, but also 
educate our voters uh, about what, where, and how to cast their ballot. So, um, Maggie, do you have thoughts? And you know, it's about two and a half weeks left, um, and they're they're in addition to um, uh, the Brennan Center being on this call. We have we have other uh, third party groups um, uh, that are joining us today. Do you have thoughts on? Um, in the last couple of weeks, things that outside groups can be doing to be helpful? Well, sure. First of all, you know, elections are always a team effort, and there's no such thing as an election uh, that that is done in a vacuum, right? Uh, you know, I was in uh, Shane's role for 10 years as a local election official in uh, the largest jurisdiction in my state and, and now as Secretary of State, and I could tell you that um, partnerships with third-party organizations, especially those uh, that have the best interest of voters and helping to educate the public, while at the same time, you know, having the back of election officials uh, in mind is is really important. Um, so obviously, you know, groups have different sort of um, priorities, and and I think for the most part, the, the the priorities that I see out there are helping to educate and mobilize voters to the polls, and especially in light of you know many of the last minute changes that have occurred. You know, and helping to educate um, those voters about, you know, how how they can go about getting registered and participating in the voting process. Um, from the NASP perspective, National Association of Secretaries of State perspective, one of our major uh, endeavors over the last year and a half has been our Trusted Info 2020 campaign. And that is a campaign that is uh, primarily for the purpose of, of trying to urge voters to go to their trusted sources of information. In other words, their state and local elections election officials to get information about voting rather than, you know, taking at face value something that you might see on social media or something that you might read um, that's circulating out there that may or may not be true. And so one thing that partners can do, especially during this crazy time, especially when there's so much information out there, is to really help direct folks to those local and state election officials to get information straight from the horse's mouth uh, about where, when, and how to cast your ballot. Um, because the misinformation and disinformation out there, as Shane already mentioned, is just, it's ramping up to a crazy level. Uh, it always happens during a presidential election, but this year, of course, we're seeing it at unprecedented levels. Um, well, that's a great point, Maggie. And Shane, um, what? We are getting a lot of disinformation about this election. I think there's a lot of concern uh, about um, security and safety in this election. Uh, I, I wonder what you're telling um, voters uh, and others that are concerned about the election about to, to give them confidence uh, in voting this year. Are you the, are you there we go. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot they had, they had muted me. So anyway, it was like being at home. So anyway, um, now um, one of the things in terms of this that happened right after the August election. Normally, we get a breather after the August election, but as you all may recall, um, the information came out about the U.S. Postal Service, and it was a Friday, and it was kind of like, ah, oh, this is the first day we can kind of take a sigh of relief here, and instead, our phones lit up. Um, our emails lit up, um, people I knew were calling me, and they were really upset and hot about, you know, are we going to be able to get our ballots mailed back in time? Um, what are you doing about it? So literally, I spent the weekend preparing what I call 2020 voting options and explain the law, explain how we were at the Postal Service, and we put that on the front page. We've updated occasionally, and then like over the weekend, there was a court decision over because one of the things that the legislature gave was a no excuse mail and ballot option because we've always had absentee voting that you have to have a reason to vote absentee. And one of the things the legislature stated was it has to be mailed back got back by the through the US Postal Service. And long story short, the judge said on Friday, no, you can drop that mail in ballot off just like an absentee ballot. And then on Saturday, so we updated our website. On Saturday, the judge stayed the order and went back to what everything was previously. Well, that's confusing, as you can imagine, for a voter. So trying to stay accurate with that information. And what one of the things we've really tried to do is reach out to um, local media 
Um, there was a story that's been circulating on social media accounts, and I don't know if you've seen it there in New Mexico, Maggie, but that if you get a ballot that has been initialed or marked on by an election judge, that ballot could be thrown out. I've just been to poll manager training, and probably you're nodding your head, so you've seen that. And so I've had a lot of questions about that. So um, we have a local TV station that does a great job of of anytime there's something out there that's not accurate, they try to put out the correct information. And usually it's about scams, so it's a scam report. Um, but a couple times during 2016 and now in 2018, we've reached out to say this is a scam you know, product that's being put forth before the voters. And so today they're gonna be airing that to make sure voters know, actually by law, our election judges have to initial the ballots when they hand it to the voter, because if there are more ballots than people checked in and they look in the, um, you know, the tally ballots afterwards and they find those initial ballots or ballots that don't have the same initials as the judges there, then we have a high likelihood those ballots were not handed to the voter that day. So it's little things like that. And we're just reminding people, um, you know, if you have your friends, your coworkers, your social media accounts, and once you get that correct information, please put that out there because we can do a lot, but we need the people that are also following us to make sure they get that information out there too. And that's helped a lot. It really is um, confusing <laughs> yeah. uh, with so with, with, and I think often, you know, even, even um, if there's a, a court decision that's, um, or something else that's happened that's not in your state because media is so national, it's mm -hmm. very easy, I think, as a voter to get confused. Um, Maggie, do you do you have a message for voters about how they can vote with confidence this year? I mean, I have many messages about that. I think you know the the first thing that voters need to know is that elections country, uh, no matter Democratic, Republican, or otherwise, are, are working so incredibly hard and diligently to ensure that every single voter can cast their ballot. Um, they're, you know, they're surviving sleepless nights and um, doing everything possible that they can. I think the other thing that's really important for folks to know is that, and, and it's come up a lot recently, in conversations that I've been having, um, you know, the election is is not done behind closed doors. Elections are a very public process, um, and you know, voters can have confidence that there are always and and or eyes of both parties on pretty much every step in the election process in every state that you go to, um, and so there's a lot of transparency built into the election process. Whether you're talking about Qualified and certified uh, observers, you know, uh, challengers, they have different names in different states who are observing the election process, third party organizations, academics, sometimes even uh, delegations uh, that are, you know, observing the election process, you know, whether it be in the polling place, in the mail ballot uh, counting arena, uh, the Process, uh, which, you know, this is the other piece that I really want to emphasize about, you know, having trust and faith in our election process. There, most folks go to bed on election night uh, once all the, the results, that, you know, have been put out and, and feel like the election's over, but officials around the country are diligently working for days weeks after the election, not just to finalize those initial totals, but to actually go back and completely audit those results from start to finish to make sure that every uh, vote is adding up. That's called the canvas of the election. And before a, a results are finalized or certified is the term that we use, um, there is this whole uh, process that every jurisdiction goes through to make sure every ballot issued equals every ballot cast or split or you know, disqualified if, if that is the case. Um, and then that final certification uh, when it goes through its certification process is also a public process, right? So these are the kinds of things that I try to emphasize when when trying to reassure folks the integrity of our election process. Yeah, that's so important. Uh, I, you know, I think a lot of people are probably so sick of hearing about the election after election day that um, uh, they tune out. But I, I do think the more that we could help people understand that, um, the more reassuring it, it might be to folks. Um, Shane, you know, you talked a lot about the the, the need to uh, clear up disinformation, um, confusion. 
with voters. What are you finding that that um, this year, the common questions that you're getting from voters, is it around this disinformation? It is around uh, the new methods of voting? What are you hearing? Well, and really up until this November election, we would have questions, but once the November election, that clock began to tick after August primary, that's when we began to see the volume of questions because that's when everyone gets engaged. You're out of the political primary. You're now ready um, for the general. And of course, um, the biggest question we've had for people who are now voting by mail is when will my ballot arrive? Have you received my ballot? Can I drop my ballot off? Um, we've changed our voicemail here at the office. We put that information on that informational sheet I told you, um, what are my voting options for 2020? Um, but right now, because of the concern about the Postal Service, a lot of it centers around, do you have my ballot? When is my ballot tabulated? It is all about you know the, the custody of that ballot once we receive it, and of course, prior to receiving it. And we're doing all we can. Um, to be helpful, but even ballot tracking, um, I explained to our news media recently, we're still really in the embassy of that because when you work at the Postal Service, they can let you know when it's mailed out. They can let us know um, when it's been you know, sent to our office in terms of received, but they're not giving us, at least in the Midwest, it may be different in Mexico, they don't have the technology here to really tell us like when you get a FedEx package, where it is at at each point and location, we just know they've mailed it and now it's been delivered to us. And that's the extent of it. So we're working with our RES team, for example, to say, okay, we've sent your ballot to the Postal Service and now we've received it back. That's really frustrating for voters, as you can imagine, because they want more information. And so those are really, um, for us, um, in terms of questions, it is all about the ballot as it should be. Um, and so we just continue to communicate with them through email, through um, you know, making sure when they call in, they get the information of kind of the top two to three questions that we are getting, and then just continue to work with media. Like we had a press conference earlier this week at the post office, um, invited our mayor, invited the postmaster locally. They um, decided not to join us, but the whole point of it was next Wednesday, the 21st is the last day you can request to have your ballot mailed to you. Now you continue to vote in person absentee, but we're continuing to do everything we can to make sure voters have that information because come Thursday, they request that ballot to be mailed to them. We don't want them to say, well, I didn't know about that. I didn't hear about that. So we're really trying to push that information out there based upon the questions we know we're getting. Mm -hmm. And Maggie, I, I, I'm not actually sure that I remember what kind of uh, mail voting, the percentage of mail voting in Mexico had before 2000, when it was a little bit more common. Well, it, it was somewhat common. Um, we we had done a lot of work over the last really 15 or so years to expand uh, and make the early voting process so easy for voters that what we had started seeing was a decline in ballots and an increase in in-person early voting. Uh, and then, so, you know, looking back at the last general election or two, we were seeing maybe 15 or 20 percent of our total vote through absentee balloting. But then, of course, uh, with this year, um, in our primary election, 65% of our total record-breaking uh, vote was uh, done by absentee. I think we're on track to see the most absentee ballots ever uh, here in New Mexico this year. We'll see how that spreads out uh, between mail balloting and early voting. I, uh, I feel very safe to predict that the vast, vast majority of will be uh, in the bank before election day, either by mail or early voting. But yeah, we definitely had that experience of sort of going from sort of a middling state where it came to, to vote by mail to, to really having, you know, a, again, a record turnout in terms of vote by mail in our June primary. And I, again, I predict this November as well. And are, are you seeing some of the same kind of um, questions that uh, Shane was talking about from, from voters around mail voting? And, and have you had a similar experience with the uh, ballot tracking questions? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, when you when you have a, a huge group of voters who are participating 
uh, in the election process through a new a new to them way of voting, such as voting by mail. Uh, for example, you know we have certain kinds of elections in New Mexico that are 100% conducted through the mail. But for me, as a voter who's been voting in every election since I turned 18, this was my first uh, experience applying for and voting uh, by absentee ballot. I'm sort of a dedicated early voter. So like me, many other people are doing that for the first time. And just this sort of new process and, and sort of all of the different steps that you have to follow uh, to get your ballot, to make sure that it's properly you know, returned and, and with the appropriate information has created a lot of confusion. We learned some great lessons in the primary about what we needed to do differently for the general. So for example, we uh, changed the requirement for what needs to be on the outside of an envelope uh, in uh, to return an absentee ballot during our uh, special legislative session that we had this summer here in New Mexico to make it much simpler, requiring only a signature in the last four digits of a social security number as a opposed to like nine different pieces of information that were previously required. And we have implemented the intelligent mail barcode uh, for every ballot uh, in New Mexico for this general election. It has been a heavy lift in terms of the logistics and the technology required. But now for this election and moving forward in every election, a voter can track their ballot uh, through the mail process just like they do uh, an Amazon package. Um, and that is something for states uh, that, you know, like, like Missouri, I, I could see how that would be a huge advantage to um, local election jurisdictions because, you know, it'll, it'll reduce significantly the number of calls that that those jurisdictions are getting about, you know, where's my ballot? I, I you know, I see that it was sent to me, but I haven't gotten it. Um, so as we move forward and as states continue potentially to expand their their mail balloting uh, past this election, having that intelligent mail mail barcode uh, system in place is is just a great tool. So I want to. Um... Uh, open up for uh, questions from the audience. Before I do, I have one last, uh, well, actually, it's going to be my second to last question for, for both of you, but last question before we, go, we, we turn to audience questions. Um, this, ha this has been a series uh, focused on election security. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Shane. Uh, the best uh, advice you feel you've gotten around um, election security and elections? My answer is really short. Have a plan. I think that's the thing. And, and I think at least as an election official, that can sometimes be the most challenging thing because as probably most um, election officials out there, you have other duties than just elections in your office and you have other demands you have to meet. Um, and so um, it is a constant you know, challenge to try to make sure you're, you're up to the demands of the day and you're also looking towards what is going to come in the future and have that plan and be ready. And so um, we started working on that earlier this year um, with our IS team, with the Secretary of State's office, and then COVID-19 hits, you know, people can't come to work, we're socially distanced, all these challenges happen. And so that's something that's constantly in the back of my mind. And, you know, I even meet with our IS folks um, last week about this. So we're continuing to work on that. But knowing what you're going to do versus reacting to what can happen is a lot better um, strategy than um, what we've probably done in the past, which is, oh, I didn't know about that. Let me see what I could do. Clearly, in this day and time, we've learned um, from 2016 that we need to have a plan and need to be prepared and ready. Maggie, what about you? So, say that again, Larry. I said, what about you in terms of- Oh, uh, I thought you said, what do I do? And I was like, I don't know, Larry, what do you do? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, first of all, everything Shane said, uh, just echo that 100%. Um, you know, planning and preparation is always so critical for election administration and, and this year more than ever. And I, I always liken uh, what we do in terms of planning for elections uh, to changing the tire on the car while the car is already moving, right? We are literally always planning and preparing. And then, you know, again, this year, the pandemic sort of providing this new uh, challenge, opportunity, if you will, to continue uh, our, you know, how we do that better and, and more robustly. Um, you know, the other thing uh, that I think is really critical is uh, patience 
and putting a, a good system in place for how you can respond to constituent questions and concerns. You know, one of the things that we've seen in New Mexico is, you know, first of all, uh, again, you know, I've been doing this for 14 years now, and and I see what is, in my estimation, unprecedented interest in this election. Um, a, a local political scientist has said that we could see as high as 80% voter turnout here in New Mexico, which would just, I mean, shatter every record possible, right? And, and we're looking at record turnout across the country. So there's unprecedented interest, but also unprecedented questions, right? Uh, especially as you have new or infrequent voters coming into the equation. And so um, doing everything you can to have an effective system in place to respond to those constituent questions and concerns because, you know, the reality is we live in this very uh, sort of on-demand society now, right? If, if I want to watch any movie, uh, I can literally just turn on my TV and click a button and get whatever movie I want. I can check, you know, I can, I can do financial transactions on demand. Um, and so for voters um, not being able to get their question answered immediately is really challenging. And so doing everything you can, um, and for example, in New Mexico, we're taking advantage of a program through our state personnel office where uh, local recipients of temporary uh, assistance to needy families uh, are, are actually working as temps uh, in state and county offices around the state to help answer the phones, respond to emails, answer questions about, you know, where, where, and how, where, when, and how to cast a ballot. Um, so these are the kinds of, of, of things that I think are the most helpful right now. That's great. So, so um, Maggie, um, this is a good segue to um, uh, some of the audience questions. I'll, I'll give the first one to Shane. Um, how can individuals help ensure safe and fair elections locally? Um, you know, one of the things we continue to make sure is they know their options. And when they know their options, they can make the best decision for them. And so that's, for example, um, the legislature made provisions for people to, if they're an increased risk in terms of if they contract COVID-19 for severe illness per CDC guidelines, they can vote absentee without having to obtain the notary because um, there was confusion. We had a health-related request in the past, but didn't really address, you know, what if you contract something, is there a provision there for you? There was not. And then they did the no excuse mail and ballot option but we want to make sure voters have that information because then they're empowered to do what is best for them because we're doing everything we can when they come on election day. Um, for example, in August, and we're continuous through November, we have two people that all they do is they're dedicated to cleaning and we're trying to add a third person in for the busier polling locations so that voters, if they want to vote in person, because there is that trust issue because of the media stories during the year about the post office, we want to let them know this polling location is going to be safe in terms of cleanliness of it. And we've got the social distance markers. We have the plexiglass. We have the face shields. We provide them if they don't have them. Um, we're going to give every voter a pin this time. We're, you know, In August, we were cleaning the pins as they used them. This time, because of that grant I talked about, we're purchasing pins for every voter to take with them so they don't have to worry even about those little things. And so when they have that type of information, they can choose what is best for them uh, in terms of their voting options and making sure it's safe um, when they come to vote. Maggie, that's a that's a good segue into the next question that we have, um, which is what are the what are common best practices to watch for or make sure are happening um, at the polls and at drop boxes? Wow. Well, that can that can involve so many different areas. Um, let, let's talk first about just sort of you know common common best practices around polling places. Um, you know, obviously ensuring you know adequate parking, adequate path of travel for voters with disabilities, um, making sure that those uh, social distancing practices are in place at the polls. And one thing that I really want to mention is. With social distancing at polling places uh, mandated now throughout the country, you're going to technically see what looks like a really long line, uh, often you know winding out of a door and, and around you know a, a building even. And you know keep in mind that that's that's for a reason. It's to keep everybody safe, and that line may not actually be as long uh, in terms of the timing as it may look uh, to the human eye. 
Um, it's also important to make sure that, you know, if, if you're seeing a polling location or, or more importantly, if you're not seeing a polling location because it's not well marked or visible to the public, that's something to, you know, alert your local election official about. Every polling location should be adequately staffed with a, a precinct board. One thing that should not be happening at the polls is we should not be seeing a presence of armed law enforcement anywhere around polls. That's a violation of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So if you are seeing uh, an armed public safety officer, they should only be there uh, because they're responding to a public safety need or emergency that the county or, or, or the election official at that polling place has called them in to help deal with. Um, so these are these are some of the things. The other thing is that pretty much every state has a requirement to prevent uh, campaigning or electioneering happening from too close to the polling place. So if you're seeing that kind of activity, if you're seeing a lot of you know campaigning happening too close or, or people approaching voters as they're in line, um, if you're seeing places where folks are walking in with overt you know uh, pro Trump, pro Biden, pro this, pro that stuff, um, that's also something that should not be happening at polling places. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, here's a question that we got from the audience. We've been very focused on, uh, for obvious reasons, the voting that's happening now, questions people have now, election day. Um, what are you uh, most concerned about uh, post-election day, and how are you preparing for that? Do you want to start, Maggie? Sure. Um, I, I, you know, for my personal situation, it's a little bit different. Um, New Mexico has sort of moved away from swing state status uh, as it as it had uh, for about a decade there. Um, I expect our election results, our, our unofficial election results, I should say, to to be fully complete within a day or two after the election, and I think we'll know the eventual outcome of most races on election night here in New Mexico. But we do know that there are states across the country um, that have different, different laws, different uh, administrative challenges that they're going to have to deal with in regard to particularly processing the, this sort of massive influx of mail ballots that maybe they haven't experienced before. Pennsylvania and Michigan in particular uh, don't have a lot of time to begin processing all of those ballots. I think Michigan's got an extra day before election day and Pennsylvania can only start on election day. So it's important to keep in mind that it's going to take time. It's going to take time for these states to complete their initial count of the election results. We're not talking about recounts. We're not talking about going back over the ballots again, but counting those ballots initially and making sure there is a complete unofficial total. Again, remember when you go to bed on election night, um, most states are going to be continuing their process for days um, after election day to make sure that every ballot that was received on time is counted. Um, so we may not know the outcome of, uh, you know, especially the presidential race in certain states until uh, days or even a week or so after election day. So having patience and really, um, you know, refraining from there's there's just going to be so much speculation. I mean, we just know this already. There's going to be so much speculation and rumor and disinformation that's going to be circulated in the immediate aftermath, particularly of these states that are trying to finish their initial unofficial process. Um, so just do your best to refrain from sort of getting in the mix on that and helping, you know, to perpetuate mis or disinformation around that process. That's that's really helpful, Maggie. Shane, are are there um, same different things that you're concerned about after election day, and 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 steps you're taking now to uh, ahead of that? Well, it's interesting. I think here in Missouri, we're very similar to Mexico in that we're no longer a swing state. Voters should know, as I tell local media, what the results are the night of the election, unless there's an equipment malfunction, which happens, um, or unless there's a really close race and. That's one issue that, um, for example, we've got a local state rep race. Um, you know, I keep trying to tell everybody in the office, it may not be over election night. What if you have a tie, right? And I kind of, that's my knock on wood statement that I use because I want to be mainly prepared 
for those outcomes. And then I think the other issue that we're going to get, did you get my ballot? I think that will continue after the election and, and we're going to have to continue to respond because um, the ballot has to be here by seven o'clock the night of the election, unless you're military overseas, then we have till Friday at noon. And so, and as I try to, you know, explain to voters, um, you know, the legislature years ago, I think, decided that if you have the option to mail in a ballot, that ballot is treated just like a voter on election day. It has to be in the office by seven o'clock. And if they're not happy with that, by the way, one of the things, this is a little aside, we keep reminding voters, if you don't like the, the rules, call your legislator. You know, we don't make the rules. We just follow them. We apply them. And you certainly don't want election officials that are making up the rules rules as they go. And that's extremely important in terms of competence, the integrity of the election. And so I think we've got to continue to educate voters. Um, election officials just don't make this up. We follow what the laws are of the state and federal um, guidelines and the laws that are passed there. And that if they have an issue, we certainly would welcome their voice in that because sometimes we agree with them. We just have to follow them. So, so um I'm going to take one last audience question, and I have a question of my own. So maybe we can um, take just a minute on this. Um, but we both of you have talked a lot about disinformation, and I'm wondering what kind of coordination is going on uh, between your offices and other stakeholders uh, to address uh, the disinformation that we're already seeing and that we're worried about seeing in the coming weeks. Do you want to start, Shane? There we go. I'm sure I wasn't muted there. Um, you know, again, I'm really fortunate here in, um, I'm in Springfield, Missouri, Greene County, Southwest Missouri. We've got a great relationship with our TV media and our print media, and they've really been, I think, our greatest partner in terms of getting information out there. And then the League of Women Voters have been excellent in terms of making sure they get information out there. Even the notary, for example, they're really helping out with the notary issue. Um, because most ballots here that are mailed have to be notarized unless they have that health-related reason or COVID-19-related reason. And so um, partnering with our local um, you know, organization like the League has been very helpful because I think voters do look to the League as someone that can be helpful to them in terms of you know this time of the year with elections. And so, and then um, again, you have your activist, and I've got a pretty good relationship with most of the activists, even if we don't politically agree. Um, they've been helpful in terms of getting that information out there to the folks that, that follow them to make sure that they have the correct facts. And so um, those are the things we do um, to try to make sure that we're partnering and getting that out there, folks. And Maggie, what about you as, as Secretary of State of New Mexico and the, the president of NAS? What, what kind of coordination is going on? Well, um, I, first, I already mentioned our, our Trusted Info 2020 campaign that we have been doing uh, with NAS for the last year and a half. So, of course, we continue to try to uh, just, just regularly educate voters to be on the lookout for mis- and disinformation. But when it does occur, and we actually had a, a, a very unfortunate example of this in New Mexico last week, an individual uh, posted a rumor which just sort of circulated like wildfire that the governor was planning to close down all polling locations starting on October 15th. Um, literally, completely, totally untrue, you know, not, not based on any fact. So we took a multi-pronged approach. Uh, first and foremost, we alerted Facebook uh, where this uh, misinformation was circulating. And within minutes of notifying Facebook, that post was completely taken down. Uh, we also notified the Department of Homeland Security, which is tracking this mis and disinformation. We alerted the FBI, um, which is you know responsible for, for prosecuting uh, you know, any attempts to intimidate or obstruct the voting process. Uh, we also put our own, you know, we have our own very ample sort of social media arm. And so we spread our own misinformation alert statewide. We informed every single county clerk of the misinformation and what we were doing to combat the misinformation. And um, by the next day, you know, that initial post had maybe, you know, been shared a, a couple of hundred times. Our post had been shared well over 1,500 times statewide. And like Shane said, you know, reaching out to our local media is also critical. We put out a statement. That 
statement was circulated on TV and radio and in the newspaper. So we feel like we did a pretty effective job at quashing that particular uh, piece of misinformation. But as we know, this is a game of whack-a-mole, right? Um, we are going to follow this multi-pronged approach every single time. And um, most states at the state level have those same tools available uh, that we do here in New Mexico. Right. This has been a, uh, a great conversation. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, give each of you just a, a couple minutes. I should say to everybody that's uh, watching, we have, we have some special guests uh, once we conclude the conversation, so I hope that you will um, stay on to hear from them. But I want to give each of you uh, time to just give some closing thoughts. Um, and in particular, um, you know, we've got a lot of election officials on. Um, if there's anything that you want to say to your colleagues, um, in the final days before this crazy election season. Uh, Shane, do you want to start? Be glad to. And I was going to add one thing, um, and kind of as, as um, a part of this is, the other thing I've done is that, uh, you know, I'm a Republican, but there's another election official in Boone County. We're the two biggest college towns. And uh, Brianna and I, we have joined together. We've done editorials to the newspapers here across the state. We do a lot of Zoom forums together. And I think that's been helpful too, um, so that you kind of take the party tinge out of it so the people know that we're election administrators. And yes, we have our beliefs, but when it comes to election administration, we want it to be right, you know, because that's what's important to us. The outcome, that's up to the voters how the election is administered, that's up to us. And we care about that greatly. And the other thing I'd recommend is, um, and this really came about in 2016, um, when I had some challenging times during my first presidential election, that is embrace the challenge. Don't lean away from it, lean into it and be thankful for it. Perspective is everything. I think oftentimes we can kind of get our dauber down and it's understandable because you have voters that are telling you things that aren't accurate and they're really hitting on you every day through the phone, through the mail, through media, through, um, you know, the, the, you name it, they can do it and it can get your dauber down. Learn to be thankful for it. And if you have a personal faith, this is a time to lean into that. I know I lean into my faith personally during this time. And also admit when you've erred. I think that's one thing I continue to try to communicate with media is we are going to make mistakes. We're going to be accountable for them when we do but don't assume the worst first. And that's what I continue to communicate to everyone so that you leave yourself a little bit of room. Don't try to put out the idea that we're gonna do this perfectly because the, as I tell people, the best thing about our country is we the people, but it also makes elections sometimes the most challenging thing is because it is by the people. And so accidents and errors are gonna happen. But you know, as you know, on social media, those things can, the conspiracy theorist quickly turn it into something that's not. And sometimes it is fraud, but a lot of times, and I think most of us agree that are part of this forum today, it's probably just human error and we're gonna be accountable for it when it happens. Um, and then finally, remember to treat voters as you would want them to treat you. Um, one thing I've really been trying to do as I get phone calls is I try to be patient. Um, I try to listen and I try to empathize with them and show kindness. And I've had some difficult phone calls, but by the end of it, the manner by which they've you know, started that phone call is completely changed and they understand that we do care about them, that we want them to vote, that we're listening to them. And so it can be very easy, I think, to kind of you know, get riled up and begin to reflect back to that person what they're giving you, resist that. Now it's easier on the phone than in person, I'll admit that you can kind of take a deep breath, but even in person, try to do that. And then as I said earlier, just let the law be your guide. You know, don't feel like you have to apologize for what the law is. Um, the law is there, we do follow it. Now, sometimes um, we may have a misunderstanding. I reach out to my counsel on a couple of things just in the past couple of days. Hey, this came up, can you give me some guidance on this? And so, um, you know, even in those, um, areas, make sure that you're reaching out for people to help you as you're, you know, because there's new issues that are coming up this year, I think as Maggie's mentioned, that have never come up before. And so I'm even learning myself. And I think all election officials made every election you learn something in 2020 is definitely um, not an exception to that. That's really helpful, Shane. Thanks. Maggie, in the last minute or so that we have, um, parting thoughts? I, I think, you know, talk about a mic drop moment there, Shane. I think he just hit 
on the head. You know, this is my fourth presidential election that I've either run or overseen here in the state. And, you know, I think the last thing that I would contribute in addition to everything that Shane already said uh, is that, um, you know, just presidential elections just have a life of their own. And uh, it's, it's really easy as election administrators to get caught up in that ourselves. And we have to remember that it's our role and our job to take a deep breath and take a step back and just keep our heads down and keep doing our jobs. Um, you know, uh, one thing we often talk about in election administration is that if we're doing a good job, you never see our name in the paper, but if you if we're doing a bad job, you will, right? And so, uh, you know, my, my prayer for every election official throughout this country is may your name stay out of the paper and may your margins be wide. Uh, here, here. I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> um, so, first of all, um, thank you both to uh, Shane and uh, Maggie for for what I thought was an excellent um, conversation and a good way to close out this series. I also want to give a huge thanks to Microsoft. Um, uh, you've been a truly fantastic partner in this series, and really a joy to work with. Um, Obviously, this has been an incredible year. It's been difficult, not just for elections, but for our country and the world. Uh, and I just want to say I have really found inspiration in getting to work with election officials this year. Uh, and before we sign off, as I said, um, we, we have some special guests. Um, first of all, we are very lucky uh, to be joined by Brad Smith, president of Microsoft. Uh, and he has a message to share uh, with everyone here today. Hi, I'm Microsoft President Brad Smith. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for joining Microsoft's Defending Democracy program and our collaborators, the Brennan Center and CISA, for the sessions we've had over the last six months. But more than that, I want to thank you for what you do every day, for your dedication to a mission that is obviously critical for our country, for your insightful questions, for your innovative solutions in what is obviously a challenging environment. You have not just demonstrated your resilience and given us all reason to believe in the integrity of our elections. I think you've given us all confidence. We're now obviously in the final stretch. We're heading towards the 3rd of November, and I want you all to know that not just me, all of us at Microsoft are cheering you on. We're grateful for your work, and most importantly, we are confident in our democracy. You'll see now a collection of video messages from some of your biggest supporters. I just want to say again, thank you for what you do, for your dedication to keeping our democracy safe and our voting protected. Hey, hey, a giant fist bump to America's superheroes. This election is incredibly important. And as a first time voter, I know it wouldn't be possible without the people who show up every day to make sure that our elections are safe and secure. The team from Center for Civic Design just wants to say, you've got this. From Microsoft's Defending Democracy team to the true defenders of democracy, we want to say thank you and good luck. I want to say thank you for your dedication to making this and every election safe, secure, accurate, and accessible. I really appreciate your efforts. Thank you, and I can't say it enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your tenacity and resilience, dedication to our democracy and the American voter, your resourcefulness in the face of adversity and derision will get you through this, will get us through. You worked really hard for this, and you're here now. You're all set. It's going to be great. All the best. As we head into the final stretch, please know that we are all here supporting you and we know that the hard work that you've done will pay off. As a former elections official, I know how much you're going through and I'm just so grateful for everything you're doing every single day to serve the voters of this country and put voters first. You do so many things to make elections happen, like serve every voter. Counting every ballot. Finding polling places. Setting up COVID precautions. And dealing with all the rule changes. I know it's late nights and I know it's gonna get even later as the next few weeks progress but nobody appreciates the work you do as much as we do. Thank you for all you've done during these challenging times to adjust and ensure that all Americans have a safe and healthy environment to vote. I've been super inspired watching election officials around the country working to make sure that their voters are safe 
working to ensure that our elections are secure. You are dealing with unprecedented challenges, including a pandemic and a new generation of digital threats. But I know you will remain focused on making sure that every vote is counted. I know this isn't the election that everyone expected, but I'm so appreciative of everything that you've done and everything that you are doing for your voters and our democracy. You are facilitating democracy during the most challenging of times when we're facing threats of foreign interference, when we expect perhaps the highest presidential turnout we've ever seen in the United States, and now with the pandemic as well. And we all know elections aren't gonna be perfect, but I've been inspired by the work you've done. I appreciate the work you're doing. These are challenging times, but we've never had a situation in America when we didn't have a free and fair election. And I know with thanks to all of you, that will happen again this year. Your dedication to providing a safe, secure, accurate, and accessible election is incredible and does not go unnoticed. Thank you to all the election officials out there for all that you do to make sure all our voices are heard this November. There's simply no election without you. I appreciate you, I believe in you, and I thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing to protect our elections in these crazy times. Keep pounding, keep fighting. At the end of this thing, you'll still be standing. Soul America's faith in democracy. Go get them.